Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Faith Bible Church of San Francisco. I am Joseph Ramos, and I will be giving the meditation for tonight. Um, before we start, let's quickly open up in a word of prayer to allow God's eyes, or rather, our eyes to be illuminated by God and our hearts to be enlightened and for him to bless this evening as we meditate on his word. Let us pray. Our most gracious, loving, and merciful Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. You have allowed us to get through each and every one of our days just to be reminded of why we live in the first place and who we live for, to exalt you up and lift you up, Lord. We just thank you for this time. You have allowed us to gather and to study and meditate on your word and to ask now of this time in petitioning to be in each and every one of our hearts to help us be prone and sensitive to the teaching and the dissecting of your word that we may, ha may have a heart that is reflective of you, Lord, that we may meditate on your truths. We may praise you all the more in spirit and in truth, a declaration of praise, of honor and glory solely and only for you, Lord. With all these things we pray and ask in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Tonight's meditation will be found, and it's a familiar passage. I would argue it's one of the most familiar passages in all of Scripture. It's attributed to King David, and it is Psalm 23. And actually, let's go ahead and read it first. Psalm 23, uh, it reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a well-beloved psalm, but also just in general, a book, a passage from scripture. And so often we hear this read studied to provide comfort, reassurance, and ultimately it declares of the truth that God, the Lord, is our shepherd. And it's important that we take note here when the author himself, David, he too once was a shepherd. And so when he refers to the Lord as shepherd, not only is David speaking of experience, but because also the book of Psalms is very allegorical and a lot of illustrations, poetic illustrations are being used here, all the more it goes to David's writing through God's holy word. And so David himself firsthand understood the caring role and provision of a shepherd to tending the sheep, his flock. Through the words of David, he paints a illustrative picture, if you will, of God's provision for us, of God's guidance for us, and of God's protection for us. So these are three things we're going to focus on throughout the whole chapter of Psalm 23. And so this psalm resonates with a lot of people, not just because it speaks of our deepest needs, which is provision, sustenance, and rest, but again, it promises all of these things with an eye of eternity, the eternal value that can only be given from God himself. And so whether we're walking through peaceful times in life, even in the valley, low valleys in our lives, there's one thing I want you to be assured of when you walk out of this building tonight, is that God is with us always, as our shepherd, as our provider, and as our comforter. And so we'll break down each verse to understand God's promises as our shepherd and how he cares for us in each and every circumstance. Six key points to illustrate the truth. Which leads me to point one, or verse one rather. 
Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse 1 here, David begins a bold declaration, if you will, personalizing it as Yahweh the Lord is his shepherd. Obviously, again, shepherds were irresponsible. They were a key role in tending to their flock, the sheep. And so as a shepherd, it is your duty to tend to the flock, protect them from harm, and guide them on the right path, which is obviously, again, going to David's illustrative writing, paints the perfect picture of how we are the sheep to the shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. And so obviously sheep need food, they need water, they need safety, direction. All has to be provided from the shepherd himself. And so what I want to pose here is, if you notice, the second phrase of verse 1, it says, I shall not want. What David is, if you will, kind of exhorting here is that I shall not want, when you properly translate it from Greek, it means you lack for nothing. Meaning that yes, even if David or even ourselves, we may not, we may not get everything we want and desire in this world. What it does say and what it does mean is that God will give us everything we need. He will never be short in providing our needs and meeting our needs every day. So that's why David here says, I shall not want. It's about having everything he truly needs, not necessarily having everything he wants, because God will always provide for our needs. And so I want to ask you, when you read verse 1, do you trust that God will provide for you, just like David, in the same way? How often do you worry about things that you want that perhaps you may not get it? Because obviously, life itself, we can't control everything. There are things beyond our control. We can't control people, their feelings, their words, their actions. There are only so many things we can contain and confine within our realm of control. And so this reminds us that if we can't control things that are beyond our control, just look back to what Jesus promised us in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Trust in the good shepherd who is ultimately in control of everything. Whether you get the thing you want or may not want, you can live with the assurance that you will never lack in all of your needs. There will be times God will even go beyond the needs and give you the desires of your heart in terms of what you want. But there are times he may not give you what you want because he has something better in store for you. And so contentment is the key in verse 1. Being content with not having everything you want, but that God will give you everything you need. Because not only he knows our physical, our emotional, and spiritual state, he will faithfully provide in each and every aspect of our lives. So that brings me to point two for tonight. The Lord restores and refreshes. We see this in verse two. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Here, this verse, David paints beautifully, I might add, a picture of peace and, again, contentment. Sheep will only lie down, if you notice, and I'm pretty sure in general just any type of animal, but especially sheep, they will only lie down when they are completely safe and completely satisfied. And so the green pastures, David alludes them to represent abundance and nourishment, not just for our physical needs, our emotional needs, but also our spiritual needs. While the quiet waters, they symbolize refreshment and rest. And so obviously when we slow down and we take time to relax, that's often hard to do. I mean, I can definitely attest to that in a world, especially that is always constantly moving forward, different cogs and machines and people always moving forward. It's, it's kind of hard to slow down. But that's the question I want to pose with verse two. How often do you find yourself rushing through life, getting things done, going through your normal everyday day-to-day -day lives, burdened with responsibilities, and feeling drained, even spiritually, or burned out, per se. 
here, again, David reminds us, because the Lord is our shepherd, it is an invitation to come into his rest, into God's rest. He offers, he, referring to God, offers a peace that the world cannot offer. Because we see that peace in this world is often cluttered with chaos, and it's always demanding it's always like, hey, let me give you this, but it's actually, no, there's no long-term promise or long-term assurance that you will have this. It's only short-term, if you've ever really noticed. And so this invitation, allow me to refer you to a passage in scripture where the good shepherd invites you to rest on the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. It reads, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So are you allowing yourself to be led into the presence of refreshment, of restoration, of spiritual renewal in the Lord? Obviously, not just for our physical state and our emotional state, we tend to overlook the importance of rest and oftentimes taking time to slow down. How much more do we take the time to tend to our needs in the spiritual aspect? Do we take time to be refreshed, restored, renewed in the Lord? And so it reminds us that God is always wanting to restore us, to renew us every day. Because the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. We are always in conflict. And so it will always be a constant contention each and every day. So that means it's not easy. So only, the only way to have strength renewed, to have another, per se, um, motivation to get through today can only be found in the Lord, the Good Shepherd, where we can only find peace, and healing because he leads us through green pastures and still waters. Point number three, which is found in verse three, the Lord restores my soul. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Again, the theme of restoration and renewal, that is at the heart of God's work in each and every one of our lives. That is the reason why he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, raised him on the third day according to the scriptures, and has conquered death and the grave, restoring and reconciling us back to him. And so to restore something means to bring something back to its original condition. And so obviously our souls, they often wear and tear and are broken down by life struggles, whether it be temptations, trials, people, or even things. There's so, again, so many things in this world we can't control. Some are inevitable. So, because the Lord is the only one who can do all of these things, we need to remind ourselves that it is not in ourselves to give us that type of restoration, to give someone else that type of renewal. Yes, God can use us in edifying each other and uplifting each other. But remember, we are all vessels from the Lord. The Lord uses us, but ultimately the source is from himself. So we shouldn't be taking any glory or credit away from the Lord. Another thing to take to, take to mind in verse 3 is he leads me in the paths of righteousness or guides me in the paths of righteousness. The important part is the very last line, for his name's sake. Why is that important? Because again, in restoration, that definition means to restore something to its original condition. Meaning we we are now revived and brought out from our old state, from the darkness of sin and brought into God's marvelous light to be face to face and into a divine relationship with him again that has been restored through Jesus Christ. So the word righteousness guides me in the paths of righteousness. It means, simply put, 
you are living in alignment with God's will and character. We are made in God's image. We are to live for Jesus alone. Therefore, since we are the sheep and he, he is the shepherd, we are to follow his lead. Not to say, oh, this is what I think God wants for me, or to say, no, I'm going to do my own way. Because that is saying, oh, I don't follow the shepherd. Or you are putting yourself as God, which is blasphemous. And so that is why he guides, when we follow and submit to his lead, his will for us, it is going to be for what is right, not for our sake alone, but for his sake and for his glory. And we are called to live in a way like that because we are sanctified. We are, to, we are set apart to be holy because God himself is holy. This longing to follow the shepherd's lead, we see this also in the same book of Psalm, chapter 25. David here displays this longing. Allow me to read verses 4 to 5 from chapter 25. Make me know your ways, O Yahweh. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. In you, I hope all the day. What David here, you can take away from what he's saying is that because often sheep go astray because, I mean, pretty much like us, we are reluctant and rebellious. We will tend to fall, fall off from God's path for us. That's why we need a guide. We need someone to lead us. And so like the sheep that often gets corrected by the shepherd, even when we do go astray again, even when we fall down, God's grace is never going to say, no, I can't. it's not enough to pick you back up. No, it will always catch us and bring us back to the right path. His restoration also is not a one-time event. It is a continual process of leading each and every one of us closer to him. Hence, sanctification. And so the Lord restores your soul and my soul. Point four. The Lord is with us in the valleys, which is found in verse four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so... What I like about David here is he starts becoming more, there's, you notice there's a shift in tone. Verses one to three start off beautiful because obviously it starts with, you know, lacking for nothing, the green pastures and still waters leading me into the paths of righteousness. And then it shifts to the, the valley of the shadow of death. You were just, he was just talking a couple of verses ago about green pastures and still waters, and now it shifts to the valley of the shadow of death. That's such a, that's such a contrasting shift. But if you really read it and reflect on it, the valley of the shadow of death, understand that David also acknowledges that the reality is life has inevitable things we'll go through. It has its dark valleys. There will be times of fear. There will be times of sorrow and uncertainty. Because obviously, we're imperfect. And obviously, we can't control certain things. But notice David doesn't say we stay in the dark valley or the valley of the shadow of death. Notice the word used is walk. And just like a shepherd leading the sheep, it will be tough times, but there is a process where that will be over. It doesn't mean we're going to be stuck there forever. And so David, the key to endure these valleys, going through these dark times, hard, afflicting times even, is knowing that, again, God is with us. He is our shepherd. He provides for us. And his presence dispels fear and brings comfort. That's why David says in the last two lines of verse four, or last three lines of verse four, I will fear no evil for you are with me. So yes, you may walk through uncertainties in life, scary challenges you will face, but John 16, 33, the world has its tribulations, but Christ assured us this, to take heart that he himself 
has overcome the world. We see this again, an assurance from God himself in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah 41, verse 11. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will make you mighty. Surely I will help you, and surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And shifting now to David talking about the Lord's rod and staff, they comfort me. These are the tools of the shepherd. One is for defense against predators and anyone wanting to attack the sheep. And the other, the staff, is for guiding the sheep. And so these two go hand in hand. And what, what we need to be reminded of is that in our darkest moments, with the rod and the staff of the Lord, he defends us and he guides us. He never leaves us alone to face the dangers of the valley the dangers in this present reality we call life. His presence alone is our comfort, even when we don't understand the situation. Romans 5, 3 to 5, how we are to boast in the glory for the, the momentary afflictions are just a temporary time, for a temporary moment. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18, I believe, the outer man is wasting, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. Because again, it is a momentary of light affliction. So even when we don't understand the situation, even if we don't, even if we can't avoid the dark valleys in our lives, take this. Because Christ has overcome the world, we can face them not only with courage, but knowing that there is someone walking beside us every step of the way. That's why it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Which brings me to point five. Verse five, where it says, the Lord, where basically it talks about the Lord blesses and honors us. It reads in verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. And so the picture here David's um, illustrating is of honor and blessing. Now, it may seem weird in the presence of our enemies. It's like God himself is inviting us to have a meal and I'm sitting across the person I hate or the person that hates me. It may seem weird. Why would, why would he prepare a table before me? If you read the, the second half of verse 5, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. It may seem odd, but the reason why God blesses us even in the presence of our enemies is that he's teaching us, and David here himself is illustrating that even when there's all these things around the world that are out to attack us for our faith, that doesn't take away from God's protection over us. His hedge of protection is so much stronger than what Romans 8, 31 to 39, not alone talks about how nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nor height, nor depth, nor rulers, nor principalities, nor things to come. There is nothing. If God is for us, who can be against us? And so it's a striking phrase, again, in the presence of my enemies. But take, take understanding with the presence of my enemies, meaning that God doesn't take away, you know, the, the people that hate us. He doesn't take away hard times. But what he does assure us is we are still able to experience the goodness and love of God during those times, even in the midst of people that hate us and persecute us. So that's why the setting is a table. It's a test for us, too. Will we rely on God even when we're met, when the rubber meets the road, when you meet some resistance? Are you going to find, the are you going to take that opportunity to find that you're still able to experience God's goodness and ki loving kindness in your life in the midst of your enemies? And so it shows us also that God elevates us and blesses us despite being surrounded by opposition. And so our cup overflows. 
because it says he anoints our head with oil and our, his, our cup runs over. What does that mean? Basically, it means because verse 5 is talking about a blessing or how the Lord blesses and honors us, it basically speaks of the Lord's abundance. It overflows. Notice how God's blessings are not just sufficient. If, it's if it says to overflow, then obviously it's more than enough. It is extravagant. It is beyond human comprehension. It literally like a cup, if you're to fill it to the brim, it just keeps pouring. God doesn't stop. That's why the abundance of God, his provision for us is more than enough because he is our shepherd, our provider, and our protector. And so when we walk with God, we experience his overflowing grace, his overflowing mercy, and his overflowing love. James 1, 17 to 18 reads, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be, would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So do we recognize the blessings that God has so lavishly placed upon us, even in the midst of our enemies, even in the midst of trials and opposition, in the presence of challenges? Sometimes our greatest moments of abundance, when we truly acknowledge that, is when we are walking through the hardest moments in our lives. That is where we see that God is still pouring out his love and his provision. His providential care never runs out on each and every one of us. So basically, what, what I'm, to simplify it, it hits harder that God is still with us when we are going through the toughest moments in life. It's easier to say that in the, perhaps, the, you know, the convenience of life. It's a lot harder to say in the inconvenience. But man, does it feel so much greater when you go through those times of trials. Which brings me to the last point, point six, shifting to an eye of eternity now. The Lord promises eternal presence. Verse six, surely goodness and loving kindness or mercy in some translations will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. And so David concludes the psalm with a praise, an exaltation, with a promise that God's goodness and mercy will follow him and will also follow us each and every day, each and every hour, each and every second of our lives. Not for even a millisecond will it stop. And so pursue, I want to focus on that word pursue, because here it's a strong word, pursue. It's more than and stronger than just simply following. Pursue when it refers to God's grace and mercy and goodness. It is an active pursuit. It is one where it, God chases after us, where God will leave the 99 and go back to the one, bring it back. He'll take us back. That's how much he loves us. It is a relentless pursuit. That's why he died. He sent his son to die for you and I, as if we were the only person in the world. He loves us that much. And so pursue here is, again, it's not just a type of word to say, oh, it's following me. No, 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 no. It is an active, relentless pursuit, ensuring us that we're never outside the reach of his care. John 10, 27 and 29. You know the passage I'm referring to where God cannot, where the enemy cannot, or no one can snatch us out of God's providential hand, providential care, and his divine providence. Amen. And so that is where I want to bring weight to the word pursue. It's, there's nothing, again, nothing to separate us from it, nothing to tear that apart, nothing for God to change his mind. And then what I love about verse 6 is the last few portions of it, or rather the last line. And I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. David ends with the very last line, shifting it to a longing for the presence of God. It is with an eye of eternity looking 
and longing beyond this life, what this life has to offer. Not, it's not saying that David doesn't, isn't looking forward to things in life, but rather it is the ultimate longing, the ultimate pre, uh, desire that can only, that is waiting to be fulfilled and satisfied because there's nothing sweeter than to be brought back face to face with our Lord and Savior and to cry, holy, holy is the Lord and worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And so that final promise David writes here assures us that our relationship with God doesn't end here on earth. It continues in heaven. And the best thing about it is it'll be for all eternity. There'll be no end to praising him, no end to communing with him, to having all this time with him. All the times we struggle with perhaps waking up, trying to have our morning devotion, pray with him. Man, it's like, We can do that forever in eternity in heaven. And the best part is we won't even struggle. It's like not even a second thought. It's like just like that. But the longing and the satisfaction of it is amplified to infinity. It is beyond words. And so with this in mind, that David is also inviting us to long and to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We see this similar cross-reference In 2 Corinthians 5.1, Paul reminds us, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, one that is eternal in the heavens. So, the takeaway from verse 6 is that this is the ultimate hope for each and every one of us that are believers. We will live with God forever. When we all die or when the Lord calls us home, that is not the end. It's actually the start of the best thing that will ever happen. And the best part is, it won't end. There is no end to it. Because how can we ever think what Christ has done for us? Because it will literally take all of eternity to thank him for what he's done for us. For his sacrifice, for him taking our place. When we should have hung on the cross and we should have paid for our own sins. But yet out of love, out of God's mercy and grace, he said, no, I will send my son to take your place so that you can live with me forever. Because I desire that. I am relentlessly pursuing that relationship with you. The same intention I had when I created Adam and Eve, even even when they fell, I still pursued them. I still showed them grace, mercy, love throughout the whole Old Testament with God's chosen people, Israel, even rebellion after rebellion after rebellion, even after David, a man after God's own heart, sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. God's relentless love never failed. So we can live in the confidence that his goodness and his mercy are with us right now. And it will be amplified all the more in eternity, in heaven, forever. And so Psalm 23, in conclusion, is more than just a comforting psalm, especially for hard times. It's a psalm that I want to challenge you is for your everyday life. It teaches us that God is our shepherd who provides, who restores, who protects and blesses us. He walks with us through every season of life, every hill and valley, every high and low, every every time it's convenient and every time it's inconvenient for us. People come and go, God will never fail us. He blesses us even in the presence of our enemies. Even if we are persecuted for his name's sake, he calls us blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He walks with us in the green pastures, the quiet waters, and the valleys of the shadow of death or the dark valleys in our lives. Because ultimately he will lead us home to dwell with him forever. So let us live with confidence in his love and his goodness and his mercy, knowing that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And with, before I pray, let me just read one last verse. It is found in the book of Psalm 27, verse 4. Again, David wrote this book, this specific chapter, rather. And I exhort you that this be your longing too, just like David, longing and desiring the presence of God. It reads, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you have granted us to immerse ourselves in the beauty and significance of Psalm 23. That yes, it is a beloved verse, but it's also to remind us that it is for our everyday lives. It may just be six verses over, but there's always something new to learn and to remind ourselves from it each and every day. Just like David, Lord, help us to have this longing, this yearning and desire for you, for you are our shepherd. You will prov providentially care for us. There will be nothing lacking in all of your blessings. In the giving and taking away, Lord, you are still good overall. And there's nothing that can separate us from you, nothing that can take us away from your love, nothing that we can ever do to change your mind and loving us. And so, Lord, I pray now and ask that as, reflect, as we reflect on your truths from Psalm 23, remind us, Lord, that you are our protector, our provider, and our comforter, not just in the highs and the lows, but, in the, but especially in the in-betweens of life. 24-7, you are always there for us. Help us to rely on you, to be assured that you will take care of us. You will guide us in the paths of righteousness, ultimately for your name's sake and for your glory. Because ultimately our longing is to be reunited with you in heaven for all of eternity. And we just pray now that our meditation tonight, and that the words of our heart and that the thoughts in our minds and what is in our hearts, Lord, may be honoring and glorifying to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.